nobody ever gets my name right anyway, so it's not, uh, it's not a big deal. Um, so my name is Matt Uye. I'm a uh, reliability engineer, systems engineer. Um, I've worked in DevOps for quite a while, uh, or been kind of a DevOps enthusiast. Um, and I've helped do a lot of like organizational transformations. And uh, over the years, I've kind of seen like trends in organizations trying to revamp themselves uh, in order to kind of build a more fluid organization that DevOps or SRE will actually fit into. Uh, and that in itself is really uh, kind of a challenge. Um, so one thing that I've really noticed is that, um, well, we'll kind of jump into it. <clears throat> so what I really believe is that uh, companies should actually engineer themselves the way that they engineer their own products. Um, so kind of in this talk, I'll go over like a hypothetical large organization that may or may not exist somewhere in the world. Uh, and then I'm going to explain how you apply software engineering laws and principles to build your own. Uh, because really, everything that I'm going to show you that happened in this large, or large organization won't really work for you. OK, so just like kind of a basic premise for anybody that doesn't know what reliability engineering actually is, or site reliability engineering. Um, it was started by Google uh, in order to maintain and deploy um, highly available distributed systems uh, in production. Um, oop, hold on. There we go. Um, so reliability engineering has since kind of permeated Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, um, as well as smaller companies. You see startups starting to start with uh, reliability engineering as a focus um, and building from the ground up that way. Um, so reliability engineers' focus is obviously on per, uh, improving reliability and performance. That comes with um, really focusing on a core set of tenants that kind of permeate the entire organization. Uh, but it focuses on infrastructure, software, and process improvements. Um, so they also work to balance the demands and reasonable expectation, expectations uh, from both the business and the customers. So I know that you saw speakers earlier talk about SLOs and SLAs, SLIs. Um, all those things, when you kind of balance them between different products that you offer, that helps. Um, this kind of like balance between what the business promises and what uh, customers expect. Oh, I forgot to click through a bunch of stuff. My bad. Um, OK, so this is kind of my mock, um, my mock organizational structure and SDLC. So, you have application development going on uh, that all kind of falls under this like software engineering house and platform engineering and reliability engineering. Application development kind of gets um, thrown in with software engineers. You have infrastructure automators in there that are kind of like embeds from your platform engineering team. Um, in platform engineering, you have uh, software engineers as well as infrastructure automators. Um, and those guys are helping build tooling and your actual platform that you're deploying on. Um, and really, like this, so what we ended up doing at this organization was really uh, building a platform as an actual product. So you see a lot of like uh, platform engineering may come out with a product like Kubernetes. It may be like a VM based you know, orchestrated products involving like Terraform and secrets management, service discovery, all that, all that fancy stuff that you see in there, they kind of streamline that process for developers to be able to work on top of. Uh, and then developers get these nice um, infrastructure automators that can come in and assist whenever needed. And then you have kind of a separate reliability engineering organization. Now, it all kind of fell down on top of the SDLC which essentially you had uh, developers that were owning parts of the SDLC from planning until testing, uh, whereas reliability engineering would kind of take over ownership in that deploy to monitor stage. Um, so anything that went to production, that initial version that was going into production was going to be owned by reliability engineering. 
what that means in a large organization is that um, if I ship version 1.1 and reliability engineering is charged with owning that, um, at that point, reliability engineering can actual, actually make fundamental changes to my code. Um, so where that becomes powerful is that ultimately, at the end of the day, reliability engineering is actually empowered to own reliability. Uh, they're not the really like sole, um, they're not the sole organization responsible for it, but they're empowering uh, that kind of responsibility within the organization. So really, at the end of the day, this worked at uh, this one organization, right? And it sounds really good, sounds really fluid, and it makes a lot of sense when I say it. The problem is, is that none of this will probably work at your organization because your organization is entirely different from mine. You build different software, and fundamentally, what I actually believe is that um, really your organization has to reflect the software that you're building, or even rather that your software reflects your actual organization. Uh, what this kind of comes down to is this thing called Conway's Law. Uh, and it's that organizations which define or design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So in ver like very layman's terms, like more or less, if you go build a really inefficient organization with a bunch of gates and a bunch of like stops within the organization, then you're going to de deliver software obviously very slow. Uh, if, if reliability is not an actual like core competency in your organization, then your software will be inherently not reliable. Um, now, it's not always going to be 100% true. I think that there's ways to overcome it. But at the end of the day, like, this is, I think this kind of like exemplifies what that, uh, what that means. So really, if you kind of go even further down that rabbit hole and you start looking at Layman's Laws of Software Evolution, he has these eight laws that um, essentially, if you look at modern day applications, um, they all kind of abide by this. Um, but they can also be applied to the actual business at large. So um, more or less in 1974, these uh, two guys, there was a guy named Lehman and a guy named Bilotti. I hope I'm not butchering their names. But they came up with these laws of software engineering. And their goal was really simple, to establish a framework for building and maintaining software in the long term. Uh, now, these guys didn't even really exist when you know, you're talking about like these. Um, I think Lehman mostly worked on like mathematical computing systems, so he wasn't even really working on like, you know, he wasn't looking at AWS Cloud or like big distributed systems like we talk about today. He was looking at, um, you know, a computer meant to do like a bunch of math for mathematicians. Uh, but still, these things are like very relevant today, and even more to building powerful organizations. Um, oh. Okay, so uh, law number one is essentially continuing change. Uh, so the process is basically the process and the way that the business operates should always be up for debate. Um, so a lot of the, all these laws actually pertain to building software, but if you treat that in the way that you view building software the same way that you view building your business, um, more or less like you'll be able to understand that building your business is very similar. So you build this organization in an iterative process rather than like, I'm gonna plan out like, okay, I need a team per microservice and like I need, um, I need to have like a monitoring organization and like all this, like rather than planning all that, take your engineers, describe your requirements and start building. Um, the next is increasing complexity. So really as part of your iterative process, your fingers should always be on the pulse of pain. Um, I think this is kind of a mantra that you hear in like reliability engineering is that you're always monitoring pain. Like where is the pain within your software? Uh, do your users have pain? Do um, do the developers have pain deploying? And more or less what you're looking to do is to relieve that pain. In the same way, you can take a business and you can take your organization and you can say, okay, I need to relieve the pain um, that, takes, you know, that it takes to affect change within here. Um, 
Next is self-regulation. Um, so empower people to make change locally and to be able to call out inefficiencies. So if your organization requires like a VP or a manager or director approval for even the slightest of changes, then you start looking at that and your, engin or your engineering organization is gonna be inherently slow no matter what. Um, so con conservation of organizational stability. Uh, so they kind of simplify this to invariant work rate. Uh, so I view this in one of two ways. Well, t there's two ways to view it. Uh, so your organization should always be in kind of a continual rate of work. Um, I think all of us kind of know that, like, if you look at a velocity chart, like, you have this kind of, like, roller coaster where it goes up and down. Um, now, the idea here, I think, is, one, that you don't let teams just sit idle. You know, like, idle engineers, I think, are what create, like, um, like, engineers should be empowered to be able to pick up projects if they don't have any projects that are deliverables. Uh, and if you, don't, if you don't have that kind of culture going on, like, stagnation is what really kills, like, big engineering departments. Uh, now, on the flip side of that, or of the same token, is that pushing an organization or team too hard actually yields the same results. Like, if you go drive this organization to deliver, like, incredible software, what you'll end up seeing is that, um, really like shortly after that they just kind of fall off. So in the end like trying to push them into deadlines that don't work like you get ineffective software delivered but then not only that um, really it, by the time all the bug fixes and everything else go out in order to ensure that this thing is like stable uh, you've actually met your original deadline of what they probably told you it was going to be. Uh, conser conservation of familiarity. So if you grow your organization too fast, uh, and I think this is pretty apparent like on software teams, like if you go just, like if you have a problem and you have a manpower problem, if you go add six developers, it's not gonna help you make a deadline any sooner. Um, in fact, it actually slows the organization down. And what you'll see in a lot of like DevOps or SRE transformations where they're trying to enable these organizations to grow is an organization will say, well, I want to do site reliability engineering. So I'm going to go hire uh, four people who say that they're site reliability engineers. The problem is, is you can't just go like shove that down the organization's throat. Um, an organizational acceptance has to be done in some way. Um, and really like what this kind of points out is that just like your software, you can't grow too fast. Um, your users, i.e., like the personnel in your company, become um, very unfamiliar with how to interact within the organization. And in the same way, like you, you take site reliability engineering or DevOps, you can't just say, well, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it today, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to grab 30 people, and we're going to be doing DevOps tomorrow. And that's going to happen, because it won't what you'll have is like a catastrophe mix of like all these things that are just very broken processes um, and everybody's gonna be wondering what the hell is going on. Um, so really this is, uh, I guess this kind of focuses on more of like a maturity pattern for DevOps or SRE. Um, so one of my biggest highlights is to allow people on the ground to be able to actually decide how DevOps gets implemented, or even SRE. Like at the end of the day, if you want to start an SRE department, like so many other companies out there want to do, go hire an SRE, bring them into your company, and say, how does SRE actually fit in here? Because there is a good chance that the things that you're doing today will not align with SRE goals at all. And it would take a major overhaul in order to make it align. Um, and you have to be willing to accept that that may be something that you don't want to do. Uh, because I think one of the biggest mantras with SRE is definitely like freedom with responsibility. Um, and that's, that's very painful to accept in an organization. It's a very challenging concept to accept. Uh, the next one is continuing growth. So this is one of the ones that got established in 1991. So layman's law is kind of uh, continued to grow. Layman died, I actually think, in like 2002. Um, but if you take a look at these laws, they're pretty, pretty interesting how they kind of evolved over time. But um, so continuing growth, 
The way I interpret this is essentially empower teams and organizations to take on responsibility as they see fit. Like allow teams to be able to extend themselves or to be able to lend themselves useful to other parts of the organization. Too many times in like big enterprises, I see that it, like you'll have a reliability engineering organization who will, who will know I need to take responsibility over here, but I can't because the organization has actually not allowed me to. Or you'll see this in DevOps departments too, where they'll say, yeah, I can actually go do that for you, uh, but you're not a DevOps supported organization at all. So I can't help you. And that kind of like red tape and politics is exactly what we're supposed to be here to undo. Uh, and by allowing engineers to be able to make the right decisions on the ground, I think that, and again, a lot of these laws kind of fall back on each other. <coughs> So decline in quality. So um, basically allow the continuous self-inspection and adaptation as the organization grows. So like make sure, like allow these changes to be volunteered locally, um, you know, or, or essentially your employees are going to view the organization as like ineffective. Um, so there really needs to be a process of continuous improvement. Like I use the term, uh, like a culture of constant change. That doesn't mean that you have to go like, just because you're using Kubernetes today, like, oh, we're gonna go move to Nomad next year. Like, no, that's not the kind of change I'm talking about. Like, it's more like an iterative change process where, okay, let's evaluate our processes. So if we have a build test deploy uh, based SDLC, like, could we add something into testing to make sure that we resolve this problem? Or do we have too many tests? It's a it's a culture of like constant evaluation of your own processes. <clears throat> and then probably one of the most important is an actual feedback system. So um, you need to have like multiple feedback loops. You need to be listening to multiple organizations. Um, so whether that's the actual business, like in, in SRE, we tend to like instrument everything. Um, so we'll instrument like important things that give us a, an idea or like feedback on um, like important processes or applications, right? So the same thing should be done within the business. Like make sure that you're listening to the efficiency of, okay, if, you know, accounting has this requirement where it comes to, you, um, you know, getting the, getting, getting certain things processed. Like, how fast is that happening? Like, are you actually monitoring this the same way that you go and build software? Um, and I think at the end of the day, if you start to look at, um, like, your organizational structure just as that, um, you, start to, you start to notice, like, there's major inefficiencies in your own organization that can be treated the same way that you solve these problems in software. Okay, so kind of my conclusion is that businesses kind of often see themselves as responsible for deciding topology and culture, and really, like, you can't force either of them. Uh, allow engineers to focus on organizational issues uh, just as they would genuine engineering problems. Um, and then culture and organizational topology should be kind of synchronous with software, um, and they should be synchronous with software and the SDLC. So make sure that like not only your topology is good, but make sure that lines up with the SDLC. Because at the end of the day, if your SDLC responsibilities don't say the same thing that your topology says, you're going to have these massive inefficiencies that cause problems. Um, and then I have a bunch of time for Q&A. But so you're your your question is more like how uh, how do SREs gain ownership of of code as it as it goes into production? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, at the at the end of the day, like, um, I think if you look at any SRE organization, like we try to automate the actual production deployment process to a large degree. Um, so what you're saying is is that you want that you want uh, you want the code separated from the people who are actually deploying the application. Um, you know, I honestly in organizations I've been in, I have not been part of um, a process that implemented that. Usually. Um, what I've seen is SREs will, so we do a, kind of like a trunk-based development pattern. Um, they will, like the dev team will go and uh, they will they will branch out a version. You'll, you'll take that version that's meant for production now uh, and that will be owned by the actual SRE team. So they do own the code and they own, um, they own the product that goes into production and the reason for that is, is in the name of stability, the name of in the name of reliability in general, if there's a hotfix to be done, it takes a long time and it's a lot of pain to go back to a development organization and say, hey, I need you to make a hotfix for this thing because it's like crashing my application every day and that's not good. Rather, what you have is SREs that are software engineers in themselves and they'll go issue that fix. And so there really is like an inherent need um, to have access to that code repository. Uh, now, I'm sure that in a world of auditing, that you could create a separation with machines, like the gentleman over here mentioned. I mean, CICD has come a long way in the last, like, 10 years, right? So, like, the whole, the whole idea of being able to separate those processes and trigger them, uh, I'm sure aligns on some kind of auditing level. But I would have to know a lot about like your actual auditing process in order to really like fully answer that. Well, and I imagine the the idea is to is to separate the process in a way that there's like checks and balances between the two, right? So, th I mean, that was really what pipelines and CI/CD are actually for is conducting those and. Like, just because an SRE organization owns a certain branch uh, and they say, hey, we can apply hotfixes to this thing, doesn't mean that, like, you build that branch and that goes to production. Like, that still doesn't happen. Really, the SRE process is a reiteration of everything that already happened before. Uh, it just means that that chunk of code is now transferred to SRE responsibility. Um, and that's just at organizations that I've been at. There are other organizations that run it completely different that probably don't do trunk-based development, uh, and they have their own methodologies.
Yeah. Um, so I can tell you the approach that I've taken at prior organizations that had like master master organizations over them. Um, that is that is really challenging because um, really in any kind of like large sweeping uh, policy change like DevOps or SRE, uh, you have to have uh, kind of what I call like top down approval. So like. CEO of your company really needs to be on board with the fact that you're about to do DevOps uh, or that you're about to do SRE. Um, more or less, you are, you are going to have to pitch buy-in to that parent organization. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of things to be able to pitch buy-in off of. But um, I mean, really, that, that parent organization has to be willing to understand that you're probably about to screw with the culture of like their child company, right? So there is there's quite a bit to be said there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I actually just came. I, I've definitely failed a lot in my career, uh, or at least my own definition of failure. Um, really, why I got to writing this, writing this talk was because I experienced um, at least probably about half the organizations that I've worked with have, like, in my definition, failed. Now, if you go ask them, they probably will tell you that they implemented DevOps really well, or that they implemented SRE really well, and that it worked for them. Um, I think at the end of the day, what I've experienced is that usually um, organizations hurt over topological change. Uh, so you'll have like one of the traditional things that I've seen is like older companies, they'll have this big ops department, and then maybe they'll even split ops into like multiple things. Uh, and then you have these application developers, and they're like, yeah, at the same time that I'm doing all this uh, topological change, I'm actually going to move to AWS, and I'm going to switch my entire monolithic application over to microservices. But I'm not really going to do microservices, because I'm going to take this big database that I have that's like all Oracle-based. And instead of making isolated databases, I'm just going to keep it as this big Oracle database. And uh, that was all kind of a lot at once. But basically, at the end of the day, you just broke half of the theories that you were playing with in an implementation. So it's really the underlying like root problem is halfway implementation. Um, take, like DevOps is built on a core set of philosophies, right? SRE is built on a bunch of tenants. OK, those things are very important to really understand like the spirit of them. Uh, like every organization implements DevOps differently. I, I can concede that. I think it, anybody in this room could concede that. But at the end of the day, um, just because they're implemented differently, they're still honoring the spirit of why they were implemented. So you can't stray from those and thinking, well, I'm going to throw out this philosophy, but I'm going to keep like, uh, you know, self-service as a good, like, that's a good philosophy. I'll keep that one. You know, but all these other ones, like, ah, I don't want that. Like, no. Like, there's a reason that all of these made the list. And it's because it really is like what honors like a very fluid organization. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, thanks. Hey, I appreciate you guys. Thank you very much.